Welcome to this service of worship on this Christmas Eve. We are glad you are with us. While we would rather all be together in the sanctuary, side by side, singing hymns and hearing the Christmas story, we are grateful to have this way of worshiping available to us and grateful for those who are providing the technology that makes it possible. So thank you for being a part of this worship experience tonight. We hope this has been a meaningful Advent and Christmas season for you, and we pray that you'll continue to sense God's nearness in the days ahead. We are always grateful for music at a service like this, and so uh, tonight, in addition to our uh, folks who work uh, all the time around here, Andy and Steve, we are grateful for them being here, grateful also for Kathy Johnson to offer her voice, uh, uh, making it an offering to God, and we're also glad to have tonight the Piedmont Triangle Brass Quintet here among us to add some richness and glory to our music. There is no better time of season than the Christmas season to make good and wonderful sacred music. And so we're glad for, to have them here as we uh, sing and as we celebrate God's coming into the world in and through the person of Jesus Christ. As you see, this is a communion service. It's also our candlelight service. We're sort of combining two of our traditional services tonight. And so as we begin worship, uh, I encourage you to get elements of communion so that you will have them ready at the end of the service so that you can participate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper uh, along with us. It's also a service that we traditionally end in candlelight. And so perhaps you'd like to find a candle nearby so that at the end of the service, you at home or wherever you are can light a candle uh, reminding yourself and sharing with us the gift of light that has been given to the world in and through the person of Christ. These are ways that we can perhaps bridge the distance between us as we share in these important rituals and reminders of who we are as the people of God, gathering at communion, sharing the light that has been given to us as a part of our worship tonight. And so thank you again for being here with us. Thank you to those who are making music and thank you to the church family for their faithfulness throughout this season. And so together, let us prepare ourselves to worship God.
Please join me in our call to worship. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And so we light the Christ candle, celebrating the light that has come into our world.
If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and we are strangers to the truth. If we tell the truth about ourselves, if we confess to the deep darkness of our lives, God is merciful and just and promises to lead us from darkness into God's sustaining light. Together, let us confess our sins to God. We confess, O oh God, that we are good at superficial celebrations, forgetting we need more than that. Give us a spirit of yearning for the good news that you have come near, that Jesus is Emmanuel, that a light has come into our darkness and our hungers have been met. Fill our hearts with holy wonder and joy unceasing as we celebrate the promise of a world redeemed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these comforting words of Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of darkness, on them has God's light shined. God loved the world so much that God sent the only Son to be with us as Emmanuel, to love us and to gather us into the gracious mercy of God. Friends in Christ, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
Before I read the familiar words of the Christmas story, I want to offer a bit of a history lesson. Because who doesn't come to church on Christmas Eve eager for a history lesson? But I want to try to make the case that this brief history lesson will give us a greater appreciation for why Christmas Eve matters, why Christmas matters, and why we continue to celebrate the birth of a baby born a long time ago in a small village on the outskirts of the world. Basically, I want you to know a little bit about Caesar Augustus. You may know that the word Caesar is not a name but a title. It means emperor. It's the derivation of the more modern word that we use, czar. When a president appoints someone in charge of a big project and gives them broad powers to act, they are made the czar of something. They, they are called the drug czar or the trade czar or the terrorism czar. So our word czar is derived from this Roman word, Caesar. Maybe you knew that. So Caesar Augustus, his name was Gaius Octavius. He was the nephew of Julius Caesar, the nephew who became the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And after his adoption, he became Gaius Julius Caesar Octavius, though still known as Octavian. Don't worry about all these details. There won't be a test. But Octavian, after the assassination of Julius Caesar, Octavian formed a military alliance with Mark Antony and Lepidus, who I don't know anything about. But they formed an alliance to go after the anti-Caesar folks like Brutus and Cassius. Well, eventually, the Octavian and Mark Antony Antony block began to unravel and they began to see themselves as adversaries and went to war against each other. So now you have the armies of Octavian going against the armies of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, a name you might know. And so what you have now is known as the Roman Civil War. Basically, 13 years of chaos with all sorts of people claiming to be in charge, going to battle with each other so that the regular folks don't know who to trust or who to follow. Every side had their own propaganda machine going. Every side tried to make the case that they were the true heir of the throne of Julius Caesar. Well, after 13 years of this, thanks to Octavian's wily commander, Agrippa, the forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra are finally defeated, and Octavian is given credit for bringing an end to this awful era of violence and mayhem. Violence and mayhem that he had a hand in starting, remember. But now, because he has finished it, he can claim the title Caesar Augustus. Augustus meaning majestic or venerable. And so Caesar Augustus now begins about a 40-year reign over the Roman Empire. And this is why I dragged you through that history lesson. Since Caesar Augustus is the one whose victory ended the Roman Civil War and stopped all of that violence that had been going on for so long, violence that left a broad swath of death and destruction, since he prevailed and brought all of that violence to an end, in addition to the official title of Caesar Augustus, do you know what he was also called by some of his followers? You're going to love this. He was called the Savior of the world. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment since Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. 
And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered, and she gave birth to their firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth among those with whom God is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying which had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. That's how Luke begins his story about the birth of Jesus, putting Caesar Augustus, the savior of the world, at center stage, which is where Caesar Augustus would see himself, of course, at the center of everything, running the Roman Empire. But then Luke draws our attention over to a little backwater town on the edge of that empire where a couple of nobodies are looking for a place to stay, and where there will be born to them a baby who doesn't look like he's going to matter all that much in the great scheme of things. But what you know and what I know and what Luke knows, but what Caesar Augustus does not yet know, is that this baby born to Mary is the Savior of the world. Now Caesar Augustus thinks he is. But if he's the savior of the world, the world wouldn't need another one, but the world did need another one. Because Caesar Augustus hadn't saved the world. He was just the latest in a long line of brutal tyrants who, through power and violence, had risen to the top of the heap. But what God knows and what we know is that the world will not be saved by brutality and violence. The world will be saved by love by freely given, sacrificial, long-suffering, patient, forgiving love. Love that endures violence without resorting to violence. Love that takes note of the hungers in the world and seeks to tend to them. Love that takes note of what is broken in the world and seeks to bring healing. Caesar Augustus had no idea that this was what the world needed. He thought the world was organized according to power and strength and ruthless displays of authority. But it turns out all that does is add to the darkness. And so even while Caesar Augustus was reigning over his vast empire, thinking of himself as the savior of the world out there in Bethlehem, again at the edge of that empire, on a night that we remember this night, a small, unassuming light began to flicker as the true savior of the world, as the true hope of the world, was born. Much has been written in recent years about why people are drawn to certain leaders. And it seems counterintuitive to me, but even though we all like our freedoms, it seems that there is something in us, something in the human personality that is drawn to authoritarian leaders. 
strong, forceful, maybe even harsh and ruthless. Maybe it makes us feel safer, I don't know, but what we know is that there's never a shortage of that sort of leader who's glad to have our subservience, who is more than happy to have our loyalty and our obedience. And those leaders are always glad for us to make sacrifices for them, to submit ourselves to them, to become pawns in whatever game of chess they happen to be playing. The Caesars of the world are glad to live in palaces paid for by the labors of the nobodies over whom they rule. The Caesars of the world know that they can start wars because other people's children will fight and die in them. The Caesars of the world are glad to have the adoration of people whose names they will never know and never care to know. There are never any shortages of people who aspire to be Caesar. And surprisingly, there is no shortage of folks who are ready to bow down to them. But Luke, the gospel writer, invites us to look elsewhere when deciding who gets our devotion our adoration, our allegiance, and our love. Luke invites us to lift our eyes higher, to pin our hopes not on whatever Caesar happens to come along, but to pin our hopes on the long-awaited Messiah, on Jesus who alone brings the healing the world needs, who alone bears the light that will chase away the darkness, and who, in a remarkable twist, does not demand that we lay down our lives for Him, but instead lays down His for us, something that never would occur to Caesar which is why the Caesars are never the savior of the world. In his iconic record from the 1970s, Thunder Road, Bruce Springsteen advises a young woman not to waste her summer days praying for a savior to rise from these streets. Speaking, I think, to the common yearning that is in all of us as we hope and think and wonder, isn't there someone out there who can make things better? Isn't there someone out there who can set things right? Isn't there someone out there who can give us joy? Isn't there somebody out there who can help secure our gladness? Isn't there someone out there who can give us a sense of hope and purpose? Isn't there someone out there who will invite us to a path worth following? The answer to all those questions, of course, is yes. There is someone. It's just not Caesar Augustus. And it's not any of those who aspire to be Caesar Augustus in our day. The Savior for whom we yearn even while we're busy settling for lesser saviors. The Savior for whom the world yearns even though the world doesn't always know what it wants. The Savior for which we yearn is Jesus, whose birth we celebrate, whose table is set before us, and whose light we seek to bear. So before I gave you my little history lesson, how much could you have told me about Caesar Augustus? Not much, right? Turns out he's just a small, insignificant dot on the timeline of history. And when have you ever had a celebration in recognition of his birth. Never, right? Not even once. But here we are tonight, 
joined by people around the planet, pausing everything to sit for a moment and to remember the birth of the one who slipped into the world while Caesar Augustus thought he was in charge. And if you read just the opening words of Luke's account, you might think that Caesar Augustus would be the one who would have been long remembered and long revered. But instead, it's Jesus. Why? Because he was and is the Savior of the world. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
When we accept Jesus' invitation to come to the table, we are stepping toward a God who has already stepped toward us. Our discipleship is always a response to God's freely given grace, shown so perfectly in Jesus Christ. This is a holy place, a thin place where we encounter God in a deep and mysterious and rich way. It's also a place of communion where we connect with one another in a profound sense. So this is why we return to this table again and again and again, mostly because Jesus invited us to and told us to so that we'd remember, but also because we found this to be a place of great nourishment and healing and comfort and hope. And so, Jesus invites us to his table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is thanks and praise. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your presence among us, for your word made flesh, for your light that shines in the darkness. To you alone we ascribe our thanks and praise, for you are the author of all our days, the creator of all that was, is, and ever will be, the one who calls us beloved. On this holy night we remember. We remember how you came to the world born as a helpless infant to two marginalized people. We remember the ways you defied logic and expectation to offer us perfect love in the person of Jesus. On this holy night, we remember the wondering and the wandering and find our place among the shepherds and angels who both confidently declare your good tidings and also wonder what all these things can possibly mean for us. On this holy night, we remember how Christ sat at table and broke bread and shared the cup with his followers, offering himself to all of them. And as we gather at this table, we too receive Christ and are nourished by him. On this holy night, we remember the depths of your love for us, that Christ would suffer and die on the cross. And we remember how the story doesn't end there. For you, mighty God, raised Christ from the dead and ushered in a new kingdom, paved the way for eternal life and redemptive salvation. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Come on this holy night. Come to this broken world. Come to our aching hearts. Come and make all things new. We pray all this in the name of Jesus the Prince of Peace, the Lord of heaven and earth, the tender shepherd, and the God of salvation. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his disciples and he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. You have come to us, O God, and fed our deepest hungers. We have yearned for your arrival to welcome you, to serve you, to honor you with lives placed before you. Receive the offering of our lives, O God, even as we receive your gift of life. As we have been nourished at this table, continue to, continue to strengthen us for our journey of faith and faithfulness, helping us to experience and to share the deep love you have shown us and the world. These and all of our prayers we make in Jesus' name. Amen. So together we light candles. You've heard the saying, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. You can do an internet search and see that that has been attributed to about a dozen people. Nobody knows who said it. I'm not sure it matters who said it. But it's the truth. You curse the darkness and the darkness is still there. You light even a small solitary candle and you've already begun to do what light does, which is to chase darkness away. We've been invited, called, equipped to bear God's light into the world. Not by grand act, but by acts of faithfulness shared with each other. If you've been here before, you know that this sanctuary filled with people holding candles can light up the room. Let's find ways wherever we are to bear light, God's light, into our world. And as we sing together and share what we most deeply believe about the good news that has come into the world.
Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He doesn't say you might be the light of the world or you have it in you to be the light of the world or you'll be the light of the world when you get your act together. He said, you are the light of the world. We already are. Because we've been loved by God, we can share that love. That's what brings light into the world, to share the love that we've been given through Jesus the Christ. And so as you continue to move through this Christmas season and the rest of your life, remember this wonderful, mysterious thing that Jesus has said about you and the way your very life can chase away the darkness. May grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you with those you love, and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen.